So, uh, so now we're going to module two, so which is uh, experimental design and ana analytical strategies. So in this module, um, um, I will go to, through um, uh, experimental design, but also sample prep and the different LCMS workflows. So the idea is not that you know all the sample prep protocols or everything uh, uh, that we can do in the wet lab, but more that you understand that everything that you do in these different steps can have, can have an impact on your data, the quality of your data, but also how you, you need to process the data. So by the end of this lecture, you will understand how to define the analytical strategy for your experiment. You will know the different factors that can influence the analysis results. And you will know the principle of main proteomics quantification workflow. So for the outline, first we are going to talk um, about the an overview about analytical strategy, then uh, experimental design with uh, different uh, um, definition on replicates, co-funding, batch effect, and randomization. Then I will talk about the quality controls, sample preparation, LCMS workflows, and finally quantification. And at the end, I just have uh, some slides on specific application. Oops. Okay. So uh, when you need to define the analytical strategy for your experiments, so the first things that you have to do is to uh, to ask the biological question. So what do I want to answer? What's, what are the questions? What are the, re the research hypotheses? And a uh, function of that, you will decide, do I need to, um, to know all the proteins that are in my, in my sample? So it would be a whole proteome analysis, or um, I, I, am I interested by a selected number of proteins for which I need a targeted uh, proteomics analysis? Do I want a PTM analysis or, and so on? So depending on that, you will decide uh, which sample prep, which is um, experimental design, the run lengths, and many other uh, parameters. But the biological question is not the only um, things that will drive uh, your choice for the analytical strategy. There is two other um, important things to consider. Of course, the budget, because uh, it's uh, usually that you are always limited by a certain amount of money that you can spend on this experiment. So uh, it can affect the number of replicates, for example, that you can analyze, <laughs> or the length of the um, of the experiment, um, and the sample availability. Yes, sometimes you are, you have not um, um, uh, many uh, replicate uh, replicate mice, for for, for instance, or the the, sum, the protein amount is very low, so you need specific sensitive methods. So basically, uh, the analytical strategy follows this, uh, this workflow. So first, you have to decide your experimental design, uh, make the sample prep, uh, the LCMS workflow, uh, before to have the data processing. So during this, uh, uh, this module, I will talk about, about the three-thirds part of this. And as I said, see how it can influence the data processing. So first, the experimental design. So first, I like to talk about the replicates. So the replicates are vital to ensure the statistical validity of an experiment. So we usually consider three types of replicates. So often people talk about the two first ones, but we like also to uh, add an, 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 a third one, uh, especially for uh, omics analysis or proteomics analysis. So biological replicates, technical replicates, and analytical replicates. So biological replicates is when you use different biological samples of the same conditions. For example, it can be several individuals, several patients. It can be several animals, like here, or it can be several cell cultures. From each of these uh, uh, replicates, you will generate one uh, um, protein samples and each protein samples will be analyzed by mass spectrometry. So this uh, replicates the measure of the biological uh, variation between the samples. The technical replicates is when you use the same biological samples, so here one mice, to repeat the technical or experimental steps. So you will produce three uh, uh, protein samples from one mice, one mouse and uh, analyze each of these protein samples by mass spectrometry. 
So it measures the technical variation of all the analysis steps, so including sample preparation and LCMS acquisition. And we can also talk about analytical replicates. In that case, we use the same process samples for several injections on the LCMS system. So here you have your uh, mouse from, from which you produce one sample, but this sample, you make three injections uh, with the same sample. So this really measures the variation of your LCMS system only. So usually the, the variation between these three types are replicates uh, is different. So the analytical replicates, they have lower variation than technical replicates that have even lower variation than biological replicates. And with the current uh, LCMS technology that are more and more reproducible, uh, analytical and technical variation is much uh, lower than a biological variation, meaning that uh, often uh, analytical and technical replicants are unnecessary. So it's, uh, it's finally covered by the biological variation. However, technical uh, analytical replicate might be uh, useful when you uh, optimize um, uh, protocols and you compare methods. Uh, you will, you want to have the even if if it's can if it's covered by the biological replicate, you want to limit the noise that can be produced by uh, your method. So you want to have the method that are as much uh, reproducible as possible. So in contrast, the biological replicates they are absolutely essential for a differential uh, expression analysis. So for research study, um, you need at least three biological replicates. But uh, you have to, you need to have in mind that the biological variation is higher uh, in humans that have different uh, lifestyle, different diets uh, than in libraries animal because they are um, growing in the same um, in the same area, eating the same food, and uh, uh, often are from the same lineage. And the variation is even lower for cell culture because usually even if you have three cell culture, they originate from the same uh, uh, or, uh, original culture. So can I ask a question? Yes, of course. Uh, some people, they believe if you are working with the cell cultures or cell lines, you don't need to have, uh, you know, the biological replicates because as you mentioned, they come from the same original, you know, uh, you know cells. That's why it doesn't make sense, you know, you have the biological, not the biological, the technical replicates. I'm sorry, not the biological, the technical replicates. I don't know, do you agree on that, uh, you know? Uh, so actually for cell culture, it's difficult to say if we are talking about biological replicates or technical replicates. Yes. Uh, let's, for instance, um, imagine an experiment where you treat the cells with, uh, with a drug. Uh, you want to have a measurement of the variation that you can have when you add this, uh, this drug. So you will add it on three uh, replicates. So you can consider the three uh, culture as uh, biological uh, replicates, but it's also finally the technical replicate of the, the addition of the drug. So is yeah, you can call that technical or biological, but anyway, you need a, a minimum of replicates to uh, ensure that you have uh, statistics to make you able uh, in the end to uh, extract the protein that are um, uh, regulated uh, between your, the different condition of interest. So um, for research studies, um, usually we, for, for us at the, at the Protomics platform of Quebec, what we recommend to people is to have a minimum of uh, 10 uh, replicates per condition if you are working with humans. Uh, five if you are working with animals, and three if you are working with culture. But as I said, it's really a minimum. And uh, it might be that uh, 10 uh, or, or five is absolutely not enough to really see your, your, uh, the variation you want to see. So um, sometimes you never know, but the, the more replicates you have, the better it is. More bio biological replicates means um, better estimation of, of biological variation a more precise estimation of average expression level and identification of a greater number of differentially expressed proteins. So keep in mind that the more it's the, it's the better, is the best. So for preclinical -clin pre and clinical study, uh, power analysis should be used to calculate the exact number of samples required to achieve the expected st statistical uh, significance for diagnostic performance. So if you are not um, 
used to uh, to statistics you you may need a statistician to help you to uh, design your experiment and to de define how many replicates you need to uh, to achieve your experiment just check my book <laughs> Okay, so the question at that um, point. Okay, so now I want to talk about confounding. So a confounding experiment is where you cannot distinguish the effects of two different sources of variation. So for example, in that case, you have a control group and a treatment group of mice. And in the control group, you have only uh, female mice and in treatment uh, group, only male. Uh, so of course, it's not possible to differentiate the effect of the treatment from the effects uh, of the sex. So sometimes the confounding factors, they are known. So you know the, the sex, the, the age, or things like that. But for example, if you are working with humans, you may, may not know if some if some people in your group may um, doing sport and other don't. So sometimes confounding factors are known, but sometimes sometimes they are they are not known. So to avoid uh, confounding, uh, you need to have an equal uh, repartition at individual in each group condition. So the confounding factor can be sex, age, BMI, drug treatment, and everything that you can imagine. So another important point is the batch effect, as, uh, as already been uh, uh, discussed by Jennifer this morning. So um, uh, the batch effect is, the, is when technical source of variation, so different processing times, different handlers, different instruments, may confirm the discovery of read explanatory variables from data. So here you see example of uh, a batch effects. So at the, when you obtain the biological, um, the biological samples, you can create batch effect. For example, if you have a plasma that is collected in different hospitals, it might be that the condition in which the, the plasma is collected is a bit different from one hospital to the other. So this could create batch effect. Uh, when you make uh, cell growth, sometimes you need to have a, a huge uh, culture with many um, uh, dishes. So it might be that you need several days. So you make your culture in several days to uh, to collect your samples, and then again you create uh, you can create batch effects. Sample and link personal also is important. You. Uh, if you perform the experiment so with uh, two, uh, two people, uh, the pipetting you are doing, the vortexing, even if you follow the same protocol, it can be a bit different and it can generate batch effects. At the sample preparation step, so it's the same if you, if you do the, this preparation in several days uh, with several people and also the reagent uh, lots are important. So. If you are using trypsin, for instance, uh, you may need several tubes of trypsin for your experiment. So if they are from different lots, you can uh, create batch effects. And at the uh, acquisition of the, of the mass spectra, it's also, uh, there is also different uh, batch effect that can happen. So if you are using the same, from the same type of instrument, but it's two different instruments, uh, if the samples are running in different labs, even if, if it's on the same instrument. Uh, when you change also the chromatography column, so it can happen during the time of the analysis that the columns start to be clogged. So in that case, you need to change uh, the column. So this will create a batch effect. And also the machine tuning, calibration, everything uh, can create a batch effect. So what is, what is important to deal with batch effects is first avoid batch batches if possible. So try to prepare the sample the same day with the same reagent loss a lot, um, run the samples uh, on your uh, mass spectrometer um, in, in the same sequence. And if it's not possible to avoid them because it's not always possible, uh, try to uh, distribute your uh, samples uh, across the, the the, the different uh, sorry the, the different condition uh, in your uh, in your different batches. So what is important is to not confound your experiments with your batch. You don't want to have one batch containing all your control samples and all uh, and another batch containing all the treated samples, uh, meaning that you won't be able to distinguish uh, one from each other. 
So it's what is uh, represented here. Here you have uh, three biological groups, uh, group one, two, and three that are represented by a circle, a square and triangle. And you have three processing batch, batches. So one in green, in orange, and in, um, in purple. And uh, when you diagnose uh, your batch effects, so you try to see if there is difference between your uh, groups in your experiments, you can generate uh, graphs like this one, these ones. So the first one is a box plot. The second one is a principal component analysis. So we will discuss that in more details um, tomorrow. But the, the PCA. Uh, um, so the, the purpose of the PCA is to show the variability you have in your different samples. So the more the samples are close to each other, the more the profile, um, the proteomic profile is similar. So here you see that uh, all the, the squares are similar, similar profiles of the, all the circles are similar profiles. So we have three groups, but these three groups, they also cluster by batch. So finally, you cannot determine if the variation that you observe is driven by the biology or by the batch effect. So the biological signal can be obscure entirely if the biological condition are confounding with the technical factor. So keep this in mind, it's very important to, uh, to understand. So in a good uh, experiment design, so your um, different replicates will be uh, uh, distributed among the batches, so which is the case here. So here you can see that if we get the first, uh, after the, the diagnosis, if we get this uh, PCA um, on the top, uh, you see that the samples, they group by shape, meaning that the biology, the, the variation is driven by the biology. And in, uh, in contrast, on the, on the bottom, you see that the, the samples, they group by color, meaning that the, bio, the, the variation is driven by the, the batches and not by the biology. So it's very important to, uh, to make this diagnosis, uh, to be able to understand your data and uh, maybe to correct for the batch effect. So in addition to try to avoid it and to distribute it, always include the batch information in your experimental uh, metadata. So if you have different uh, um, people preparing the samples, or if you are uh, if you are changing the column during your MS experiment, you have to record this in your metadata to be able at the end to correct for this uh, batch effect. And then, uh, if possible, uh, normalize and correct for batch effects. <laughs> And you make batch, are you able to do it once in a day? Yeah, so it really depends on how many samples you have and, uh, and which um, uh, experiment you are, um, you are performing. So in, with the, um, the standard uh, mass spectrometer, the analysis is about one hour. So if you have 100 samples, it means that it will be uh, 100 hours to, um, to run all of them, so meaning several days. So it could be in that time that uh, you need to change the column. Or, uh, more and more, does the, the mass spectrometer are faster. They are able to, to have a deep coverage with very short runs. So in that case, we can run more uh, sample in one day, for instance. But uh, it also makes that we want to, uh, to increase the number of replicates. And now we have uh, batches of 500 samples. So anyway, it takes several days to, to run them, even if each, uh, each one is uh, as a short uh, Shorter analysis time. Right. Uh, okay. I guess that one of the tools for batch effect correction is harmony. Like I personally work with transcriptomics analysis, and so I know that harmony can uh, fix the batch effects in the expression matrix where rows are our genes and in, in, uh, the columns are samples or cells if we have single cell array. So, what exactly does this tool take as an input? in the proteomics analysis? So um, I have not worked with Harmony personally, so I cannot really um, uh, uh, respond in details about that. But um, so what I can say is that ProBatch and Combat, so ProBatch has been uh, developed for proteomics. So it really uh, takes uh, uh, proteomics data. Um, Combat and Harmony, uh, so Combat has been uh, designed for microarray and uh, Harmony for uh, probably uh, RNA-seq, I guess. 
So uh, but in the end, what you get uh, after the, your proteomic analysis is uh, it's a table with uh, with uh, protein names and uh, and uh, I, um, intensity for each sample. So finally, it's similar that what you can get with the genes. But it's, uh, yeah, it's 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 important to. Uh, to keep in mind that these tools have not been developed for, for, for proteomics, so you may have some uh, some issue in correcting the batch effect for that. So BURN has been developed by our group, so it's based on uh, neural networks, so artificial intelligence. So uh, BURN um, uh, tried to correct the batch effect uh, without um, uh, from, by taking in consideration the, your different uh, class, your different conditions, because what, uh, what could happen when you correct for batch effect is also that you uh, lower the real biological variation. By, too, by correcting too much, you can also uh, remove the, the, the real variation. Um, so, the, so on these slides, there is like a pipeline that has been suggested for, uh, batch, for batch effect correction. So basically is when you, so first you diagnose your batch effects, then you try to correct, and then you assess uh, the, the, the correction and compare uh, to uh, the initial data before to go to for downstream analysis. So the last point uh, concerning experimental design is the randomization. So the randomization of samples prevent bias in breaking by breaking the connection between technical and biological factors. So for instance, the, the sensitivity of MS instrument can drift over the time. So because of column fooling, the MS uh, sensitivity can uh, decrease. So it's what you can see here with the gray dots. So when you analyze your groups one after the other, so in, in that case, you analyze all your control first and then all your um, uh, treated patients uh, in a second. Uh, here you can observe what would, should be the real biological variation for, for one protein, for instance, but because of this uh, loss of sensitivity, the difference between the two groups is strongly reduced. So you may lose the information uh, because of this uh, uh, sensitivity drift. So it's important to have a randomization of your samples. So what's, uh, what is here, it's what we call the complete randomization. So all your samples are completely randomized. So you see that you, uh, you get back your uh, uh, your uh, difference between the groups. But uh, when you are using um, the complete randomization, it can happen that several uh, samples from the, from the same group are analyzed one after the other. So what we also like to do is block randomization. So with blocks randomization, we first uh, completely randomize the data set. But then we generate experimental unique containing a balanced number of samples from each group. So you see, we have only two groups. So we, cre we create groups of two. So sometimes the, uh, the control is running first and sometimes the, the, the treatment or the, 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 other, the other group. And uh, but this means that in the end, we will never have more than two uh, samples from the same group, one after each other. So it balances even more the, the drift on all, uh, all the data sets. So random, uh, randomization is uh, also very, very important when you have batches uh, because um, <clears throat> so. It's important not only at the MS acquisition, but also at the sample preparation. You really need to, um, to equally distribute uh, your groups among the batches, as I said a bit earlier. <laughs> you see here an example where you have, um, so it's, it's um, this is for the group, but it's also for the confounding factors. So here you have uh, uh, two groups, so the, the red and the, and the black, but you have also a sex, uh, male and female. So you want to have, one of each uh, group and confounding factor in each block. And you are an equal distribution between the different batches. So it's important to remind that failure to randomize samples among the groups defined by technical covariates makes the correction of batch effect impossible and jeopardize the results. So before before to, to go to a quality control uh, section, do you have question about the experimental design? Yes, I mean, I I understand the, the rationale about it, like, like um, 
research um, by shipwrecks that handling and so in a clinical uh, experiment, for instance, no, a different sample and so. In my case, for instance, I um, I work with uh, with fossils, and we're trying to um, let's say validate like uh, the the proteins that, that we have there. Some of them that they have, they, they could have a uh, different variation as uh, modern day species and so. And sometimes it's really difficult to get replicate because of uh, of uh, uh, two destruction or so. Th th there are some samples in which I have just uh, this one sample, which is, uh, has already been run. Um, for instance, in that case, uh, if it's not possible to do more replicates with the same sample, like bi biological ones or so, um, how would it be possible to validate that um, the proteins that you're seeing there are actually there? Or yeah, yeah. Basically. So so what I uh, explained here is, is really uh, advice, but um, finally sometimes the the condition makes that you are, you are not able to uh, to meet all these uh, recommendations. So yes, if you have uh, one replicate per group, it's, it's clearly a problem. You won't be able to really have uh, uh, statistics. So, but um, there is cases where you can uh, maybe uh, group your samples, even if it's not a perfect, uh, perfect group, perfect homogeneous group. Uh, it could happen that you, you that you can create other groups. I, I am I'm thinking, for instance, to a, a project on rare disease that we are um, um, uh, performing on the, on the proteomic platform. So this patient, they have a mutation in uh, in genes um, uh, in the pathway of the, the of ubiquitin proteasome, so the degradation of proteins. So they have mutation in different genes. So finally, we don't have, it's very difficult because it's rare disease, it's very difficult to have patients that have exactly the same mutations, but they all have a mutation uh, within this pathway. So we have grouped the, the, the patient uh, having mutation in the same pathway more than exact same mutation. So it's not, we're not sure in the end that we will be able to discover something, but at least it's a, uh, uh, it's a trio because uh, but yeah, sometimes the biology makes that you cannot uh, follow this uh, recommendation. But you will always have to think, uh, is my experiment doable finally? It's, will I get really a result in the end or not? I'm oh, sorry. multiplexing <laughs> Um, do you observe batch effects within like with TMT? Do you observe the same things? Would you organize your sample types to be similar to that? Yeah, for, for TMT, it's, it's also very important to balance uh, yeah. your different uh, groups, especially because uh, in each group, you will, if, um, if you have several uh, TMT experiments that you want to align in the end, you will get uh, different leads uh, of proteins from the different um, the different TMT experiments. So if you want to analyze everything at the end, you will lose uh, information uh, that you can overlap between the different experiments. So yes, it's very important to, uh, to equilibrate the the different uh, replicates uh, and groups among the TMC experiments. Uh, so, if you send samples to the proteomics platform, do you really think a complete randomization automatically, or should we say what kind of randomization we want, or should we do it before sending a sample? So, usually, yeah, it depends a bit of the experiment. Usually, we do it if you send. And a, a big uh, batch of samples, it's clear that we are going, usually we make a double randomization, one at the sample preparation step and one at the injection. Uh, but uh, yeah, if you say I want or I don't want a randomization for these or these reasons, or uh, sometimes it could also happen that uh, for people, for example, um, uh, uh, working with, um, trying to identify partner of um, uh, in an immunoprotein partners in an immunoprecipitation, you have a control with a non-specific antibody, and then the, uh, the antibody recognizing your complex. In that case, we don't make the randomization because we, we want to be sure that there is no uh, cross-contamination from one run to the other. So we run all the controls and then all the uh, the, the, the testing uh, samples. So, but yeah, of course, we always discuss with, uh, with people sending samples and uh, give recommendations.
I want to know if uh, we add a process in the entire cocktail, you know, to the lysis buffer, it can affect the, uh, you know, the uh, region from narcissistic or it's okay if we wanted to add, because routinely when we wanted to, you know, extract the protein, we need to add this protease, uh, you know, in the entire cocktail, like peak or PMSA. Is there routine, for example, in my lab? I don't know, is it allowed to add this kind of, you know, additive uh, to the buffer or not? Uh, yes, it's even recommended when you extract uh, proteins. If you don't have protein ice inhibitors, uh, it make, um, you can get uh, the uh, proteolytic um, degradation of your protein. So it's important to add it. It can affect the trypsin digestion, but usually we have step to read off the uh, the protease inhibitors at the step we make the protein, um, the trypsin digestion. So yeah, of course it's important to, uh, to communicate some of the protocols that you are using before to send your samples to any platform. Say so my samples are in this prefer I added uh, protease inhibitors. Is it the same for the other inhibitor? For example, because in my case I have to check uh, the glycosylation. Like, we have also some special inhibitor, you know, to just inhibit some enzyme which will and break, you know, the glycosylation from proteins. Also, you know, I'm allowed to add whatever I would like, you know, to my buffer, you know, and sorry, I'm asked this question because I have to explain, make it, uh, you know, in my lab by myself from scratch. That's why my questions are very messy. So I see, uh, so... I, as you said, I think it's, uh, it should be okay for 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 trypsin digestion. But uh, yeah, anyway, my recommendation will be yeah, tell the um, before even to doing your 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 your, your experiments, uh, tell the people that you want to uh, to have a proteomic analysis. Is this buffer compatible? So it's really important to have a communication on that. Also, freeze and thaw cycle can affect the proteins. Or you know, oh, sorry. Freeze and thaw. You know, for example, some days when you extract the proteins, mm -hmm. maybe on the same day you cannot transfer to the facility. You have to just freeze them. You know, and send them. I don't know, few days later, or you know, you just recommend this, you know to do the extraction. You know, on the same day you wanted to send the sample to the facility. You know, this kind of stuff mm -hmm. can affect the quality. Yeah, so um, we are used to work with frozen samples because yeah, most of the time you cannot process all the samples in one day, even if if it's if you have them here. And um, usually the recommendation is to keep the sample at minus eighty. Right. Uh, yeah, peptides can be uh, can be stored at minus twenty, but uh, even better, it's even better to keep it at minus uh, minus eighty as and send it on on um, on dry ice. And the last question, as much as I know, for example, in the RNSA, when uh, people, they want to send their samples, they have some control, uh, you know, in each run, because, for example, people, they will have many samples, and then they wanted to just run it in you know, one, uh, you know, round of experiment, it's not possible. That's why they have some controls, and that control will be repeat each time in each run. Is this kind of control exist for protein? Uh, you know about so it's just the topics of oh, the yeah, three next slides. So <laughs> it's <good>. perfect transition. <laughs> So, so the quality control, there is different um, type of quality control. So um, the quality control, they are used to um, assess the sample preparation uh, quality and also the LCMS system um, acquisition um, quality. Uh, we can also use the QC uh, samples to make a normalization or for batch effect correction. So they are very important in proteomics. So we can distinguish three types of QCs. So the first one is to uh, for the system suitability. So if I give you an uh, example, so it's not all the uh, platforms are doing the same, um, uh, use the same QCs. So here, for example, in Quebec, we are using a cyto C digest. So it's uh, so cytochrome C is a small protein, so it gives only 10 peptides. So we inject uh, this uh, cytochrome C digest every 12 injections. So, and for each of these injections, we um, get the peak intensities and the retention time of these 10 peptides. Try to monitor if the, if the mass spectrometer is not uh, uh, deriving in, a, in sensitivity. So we have um, a limit at, that give us a go or no go for, for, for the next samples. We are also using another um, sample, which is uh, an ILA digest. So, it's a, it's a digest of a wool um, ILA cells. So it's a commercial um, uh, product that you, you, can, uh, you can buy. 
And uh, from this uh, LA Digest, we checked the number of protein IDs that we can get with a standard proteomic experiment. So we run it always with the same methods, and we know how many uh, protein identification we should get from these samples. So we use it in addition to the cytochrome C because cytochrome C is only 10 peptides. So it can show you if you have a small loss of, of intensity, but if there is other parameter that affect the analysis of a complex samples, we could see it with the LA Digest. And usually we run that before and after each uh, sequence or each experiment. So it also exists internal standards. Uh, so it's an internal QCs. So um, we don't use it uh, um, uh, systematically. So it depends a bit of the experiments. But uh, here are examples of, uh, of internal uh, QC that you can have. For example, you can spike uh, one protein, for example, yeast uh, inolase. Uh, at a very small level in your samples, and this is uh, spiked at the beginning, beginning of the um, of the experiment at the sample prep step to uh, monitor that uh, the digestion of uh, of your samples is um, is uh, um, is uh, appropriate is, is good. Uh, we can also add uh, peptides uh, directly in the sample. So there are a different uh, set of peptides that, uh, that are commercial. So for example, the PRTC from Thermo, it's 15 peptides, or the Procal are 14, 40 peptides that we are uh, using, using here in, um, on the platform. So we spike these peptides in the, in the samples, and it's, uh, it is used for, to, to monitor the quality of the LCMS uh, acquisition. Uh, not even familiar with like spiking. Does that mean just adding the MCMS to your sample, like all the samples? Yeah, exactly. You add the the, the standard directly in the samples. So it's important to uh, to consider the amount of uh, internal solvent you want to add in the in the samples because you want to be able to detect it. But if you add too much, it can uh, cover also the um, it can mask the signal of other uh, proteins or peptides. So, so. It's important to to uh, to assess the, the amount you want to have. And the third uh, type of uh, QCs is external uh, QCs. So these are used when you have batches or when you have uh, different experiments. If, for example, you are uh, making an experiment and six months later you uh, you have uh, another batch of samples you want to repeat your experiment, you can use uh, these external controls. So they are run at the same time that the other samples, but separately. Uh, what is often used is the pool of of um, of samples. So what basically what you are doing is you have a set of, for example, twenty samples, and you take a small aliquot, uh, for example, one microliter of each uh, of each samples, and then you pull um, all these aliquot together. So it's like a representative samples of all your um, your um, uh, samples. And then you uh, run it at you run this, this same uh, pool of samples at each batch that you have to uh, to analyze. If you don't want or if you can't uh, make a pool of uh, of your samples, you can also use another uh, a separate samples, but it has to be representative of your sample. Um, for example, if you are running uh, plasma samples, you could buy um, commercial plasma and run it as, a, as an external QC with, with each batch or each experiment. So I also wanted to mention that it exists some tools um, uh, is, that are specifically dedicated to uh, QC monitoring. So um, I have listed some of them here. So we don't use it, so I don't have very uh, much uh, uh, information on how to use them, but I know that this exists. So we are our, we have our own uh, uh, script to monitor um, the the QC um, samples. I have a question. So uh, for all the QC tests on show, that's one task to do. Uh, what are the ones that you do at your side, and what are the ones that the you know the customer should uh, prefer and maybe sales along with its samples? Uh, so usually, so the for the system suitability is we are doing it for the internal control. We don't, as I said, we don't use them uh, all the time, so it will happen for specific. Uh, Cases, so in that case, we discuss with the customers. Uh, it would be good to add that, and uh, then we can discuss. But because it's usually at the end of the process, we add it by ourselves. 
and uh, the external uh, QC. Yeah, it depends, but usually yeah, it's a discussion if it's a, if we know that there will be batch and if um, if we know that uh, it's a long uh, experiment, uh, we like to have this uh, this pool of samples. So it's usually a discussion with the with the customers. I just had a quick question. So we've been talking about controls, and I know that to do what they would experiment, you need all these controls. But what's the implication of this of translating massive spectrometry into future to like a diagnostic technique? Because in one of the applications, there was like a publication about using it for diagnosis, using it for diagnostic um, purposes. So I'm thinking about all the controls, and I'm thinking if I want to just one sample, this means I have to have more than 30. Uh, technically final injection put in the machine between biological controls, technical one, analytical one, and then all these other controls. So how does this translate like uh, price-wise for like diagnostic uh, applications? So what, if I, if I understand what you mean, so what you are talking is more about uh, control and not quality control. So, um, yeah, it's it's important in any uh, biological experiment to define what are your controls, and of course, in proteomics experiments, you want to have control that will make you able to discover uh, what are in your uh, treated or, um, or other type of samples that you want to compare to. Uh, yeah, the quality control they are really um, done to uh, to assess the, that the, all the experiments is uh, performing well. It's not to uh, and the the purpose of this con of this uh, controls is not to uh, to show you what is the the the, the biological effect in your in your samples. Does it answer your question? Yeah. So just on a, on like a related point. So what is the cost of running one sample? What is the cost to yeah. running one sample? Uh, so it's depend of the of the experiment, but it could be between uh, one hundred and. Uh, three or uh, four hundreds uh, per sample. So it's quite ex expensive experiments, but uh, yeah, we have more and more uh, short, um, we have instruments that are that are able to make uh, shorter runs. So of course it decreases also the, the price of the experiment. The quality control, we don't charge them for, for, for our platforms. We really, are of course depending on each platform, but we don't charge that. Thank you. So no, I want to go through the sample preparation. So, no, I okay. Uh, so the sample preparation. So I won't go into details uh, of sample preparation because there is many, many protocols, many things that you can do to prepare your samples for proteomics. I just want uh, you to have um, the idea that everything that you do at the sample preparation may affect your results, may uh, affect the way you, um, you, you need to uh, process the data. So this is typical, the typical uh, uh, workflow for sample preparation for proteomics. So you have protein extraction, protein denaturation, enzymatic digestion, and peptide purification prior to LCMS analysis. <clears throat> but uh, many uh, parameters can uh, affect uh, the, the results and uh, the, the processing tool, for, for instance, the, or, or the pa processing parameters you will uh, apply to your data. So um, yeah, on this table, to have a quick look. Uh, so the spaces, for example, is very important. So you don't always have the choice of the spaces you are working on. But uh, depending on the spacing you are working on, you can, can decide a different uh, strategy. For example, LCMS analysis, if it's complex samples like humans, you need to extend the, um, the gradient length, so the duration of the LCMS acquisition, which may be not the case for bacteria, for instance. The data processing, so the quality of the protein, uh, the protein, the protein database, is important. Some spa rare species have, have um, no uh, no information in, uh, in Unipred, so you need sometimes to to use uh, de novo uh, softwares to uh, to get the information, or use another uh, spaces uh, related to the one you are working on. Uh, for the sample types, it's also um, uh, some problem of the, the duration of the analysis. Some samples are very complex or have a high dynamic range that need to adapt the gradient length. And uh, it can also affect the computational time. So when you have, uh, I don't know, 500 samples that are uh, very complex samples, like uh, will cell extract from uh, human samples, uh, it can 
it make explodes the explode the the computational time. So you have you really need to consider which tool, which which uh, computer, which server you are going to use uh, to process this data set. The protein you can extract from it, for your sample is also important because uh, usually we need um, small amount, few micrograms to perform the analysis. But sometimes you don't have this. Uh, uh, this amount, and you need specific uh, sensitive methods to uh, run your samples. It's the case of uh, single cell proteomics. I will talk about that a bit later. Uh, if you are doing an enrichment or a purification, for example, immunoprecipitation, it uh, reduces the complexity of the sample, so it also affects your CMS analysis. It also affects the data processing because um, in the case of immunoprecipitation, you have an unbalanced an unbalance, uh, number of protein between the control and the IP because the control is uh, usually you use um, uh, anti non-specific antibodies, so this, which is supposed to recognize uh, almost anything. So you have um, samples where there is almost nothing and samples where there is a lot of proteins, so the normalization can affect the results. So sometimes we don't normalize. Uh, when you are doing reduction alkylation of cysteine, so sorry, with the enrichment, uh, with enrichment, don't you also lose a lot of samples? So then you want to run it on a longer gradient to capture more. Um, so the, we usually extend the gradient when the, the, the sample is complex. So complex meaning uh, wool cell extract will be a complex samples. As soon as you um, as you purify, even if or just enrich, not completely purify, but just enrich, you reduce a lot the complexity of your samples. And you will see that if you are running a 30 minute gradients versus a two hour gradients, you won't change really the number of proteins that you are that you are uh, that you identified. So yeah, reduction alkylation is a, something that we are usually doing to have a proper denaturation of the of the proteins and uh, break the the cysteine bridges. So when you do that, you need to uh, remember that you have to add uh, fixed modification um, uh, during the data processing. So carbon, what we call carbamidomethylation. And at peptide level, so the the, the enzyme that you are using. <coughs> Is important. Usually, we well, ninety nine percent of cases we use trypsin, but it could be when you are um, specifically interested in a, in a specific sequence. Uh, it might be that you use other enzymes, so it can affect the way you are performing your LCMS analysis or the tool that you are uh, using to um, uh, that you are using in the end. Uh, some people are also doing fractionation, try to cover more uh, to, and to have a deep coverage of the samples. You can make fractions. So it makes that it multiplies the number of uh, LCMS runs. But um, more importantly, you need to, uh, to think uh, if your software tool will be able to handle this fraction, which is not the case of all tools. And finally, for PTM enrichment, um, so the, the Doing a PTM analyzing sometimes need to adapt the LC gradients, fragmentation mode on the mass spectrometer, and also uh, select the appropriate um, uh, PTM in during your uh, data processing. But the most important things to remember with PTM analysis is that it increases a lot uh, the search space during the database search. Um, I can explain that by uh, telling that, for example, if you are um, looking at phosphorylation, Phosphorylation, they can happen on serine, threonine, and tyrosine. So for one peptide, you can have one or several um, uh, serine, threonine in, the, in, your, uh, in the sequence. So it might be that this peptide is uh, either not phosphorylated or have one phosphorylation of two or even three. So the, the, the search engine will search for all these possibilities. So the more um, variable modification you add in your search and the more it explodes the, uh, the search space, making that the, the time uh, for the search uh, becomes uh, very long. And also that um, it's also uh, increased the, uh, the risk of false positives. So we have always to think, is, do I really need uh, to, uh, to see the, the PTMs or not? Yeah, so the, the summary of this uh, sample preparation uh, part is uh, know your sample prep protocol. 
What I mean is, uh, it might be that you are not the person performing the sample prep or the person performing the, um, the LCMS acquisition, but you have to know everything that has been done. If you just get the, the data in the end and you process the data, you really have to know what has been done to really select the good software and the good parameters for your search. So do you have questions? I have a quick question about the sample fractionation. So uh, I can imagine that when one fractionate or pre-fractionate the samples, then it can reduce the gradient time because then you have small, I mean, you reduce the complexity in the, in the fraction. Yeah, it's usually what we do, yeah. We reduce the, the gradient time, then the, the whole experiment is not too long. And uh, you can do that because uh, the, the complexity is lower. Yeah. So now um, let's talk quickly about the LCMS workflows. So um, as uh, Jennifer has already um, uh, discussed this morning, so from a protein samples, you can make two different types of uh, proteomics, so top down and bottom up. So bottom up is when you digest your protein, uh, usually with strepsin to get peptides that are uh, going to be analyzed. And from this um, uh, digest sample, you can perform either targeted proteomics or whole proteome analysis. When you are, you make targeted proteomics when you are interested by a specific set of proteins. So most of the uh, prote uh, targeted proteomics workflow can uh, measure um, several uh, hundreds of peptides, meaning maybe 100 of proteins. And it's usually, it's usually done either by SRM, so, uh, or which, which is called also NRM for um, selective direction monitoring or multiple direction monitoring. So this is on triple code instruments. Or it can also be done by parallel direction monitoring, as I said this morning on the uh, orbit traps. So for this, you get high resolution. And usually when you make targeted proteomics, uh, you want to have a quantification. And this quantification can be either relative or absolute. So relative meaning that you measure um, the abundance of your peptide and you compare it to an, the abundance in another sample. So you get a ratio between uh, different samples or different groups of samples. Absolute means that you really want to know uh, the number of, um, of uh, nanograms or femtonals that you have in your sample. So for that, you, uh, you need to get calibration curve and it's possible to do that with targeted proteins. For whole protein analysis, the two uh, type of acquisition is DDA and DIS. So, uh, Jennifer has talked about that this morning, and we will uh, cover that even more uh, this afternoon and tomorrow. So sometimes you need you need only identification. So it's not often, but in the in the case of um, of immunoprecipitation, for uh, for instance, sometimes you just need uh, the identification of your partner, and you don't want your quantification. But most of, most of the time, you also need a quantification. Do you have a question? Yeah, just quickly. What was uh, PRM standing for or SRM? Uh, so SRM is selected reaction monitoring, which is also sometimes called multiple reaction monitoring, but it's the same thing. And parallel reaction monitoring is a similar method, but uh, specifically on uh, high resolution instruments. Thank you. So when you need identification and quantification. There is two types of quantification, label-based and label-free. So now I want to give us um, an overview of these uh, quantification methods. So this, uh, these methods are summarized on this uh, picture. So those, uh, this part is all the labels-based quantification. So label-based quantification is when you add, um, you incorporate stable isotopes within your samples. So stable isotopes are, uh, for example, uh, carbon-13 or carbon-15. So instead to be carbon-12, you can have ca uh, carbon-13. So when you incorporate this isotope, so this, is, this, is, this isotope, they are stable, so they are not radioactive. And when you incorporate them, it doesn't change the behavior of, uh, of your peptide. They have the same uh, chromatographic properties, the same uh, behavior in the mass spectrometer, but they have a different of mass. So we are able to distinguish uh, the, the labeled peptide, the one containing the, the isotope from the one which is not labeled. 
So usually we label uh, part of the samples and the other are not labeled and we compare uh, the, the two groups. Um, so uh, in contrast, label-free quantification means that all the samples, uh, so the samples are not labeled and all the samples are um, analyzed separately. They are never combined. So the advantages of uh, label-based quantification is that it reduces the bias in the analysis. So because you uh, combine your samples early in your uh, sample preparation, um, in your sample preparation steps, so it's in your, in your workflow, you reduce the bias that can, can happen between two samples or two groups of samples. But it makes the sample prep more complicated, it's costly, and it's usually limited in the number of samples you can use. Uh, label free quantification is uh, it's a simple sample prep. Uh, there is no limit in the in the number of samples you can use, but there is uh, there is a risk of variation between samples that you need to correct at the data processing step. So the first type of um, of um, label based method is uh, metabolic labeling. So metabolic labeling is when you add the isotope very early in the process. So at, uh, for example, it can be in the culture, it is, it is here, uh, or you can even um, uh, give um, uh, food to the, to the mice that are uh, enriched with, uh, with isotopes. So when it's in culture, we call that, that SILAC for stable isotope labeling in amino acid in culture. So here you have um, one group of samples that is about one sample which is culture in a normal uh, medium, and another sample that contain uh, the isotopes. So the cells are going to incorporate uh, the, the isotopes. So if you measure the, the first sample alone, you will see a peak. And if you uh, measure the labeled samples uh, alone, you will see the same peak shifted by, uh, in that case, six Dalton. And if when you combine your samples, you will see on your mass uh, spectrum doublets and you, you, you will get the quantification by measuring the difference between the, these peptide pairs. So SILAC is less and less used because uh, it's complicated. So it's a long process to uh, label the cells and also because it's limited to two or three uh, samples. So usually we prefer to make what we call chemical labeling. So the chemical labeling can happen at protein level, but most of the time we do it at peptide level. Is what we call um, I track or TMT, more often TMT. So TMT stands for uh, tandem mass tag. So in that case, when you have different samples, you can um, label uh, chemically each um, each sample with a different tag. So the tag will be um, uh, uh, linked to each um, amino groups of each peptide. So on lysines. And uh, once the labeling has been done individually, all the, uh, the samples can be combined and analyzed all together. So the, on the MS1 spectra, you will get only one peak for all the samples. But when you make the MS2 um, fragmentation uh, spectrum, you will get a set of reporter ions in the low mass range. Here it's a zoom of this. And you see that you have peaks that correspond to the different reporter ions. So one reporter corresponds to one sample. And we can see the different quantification by measuring the intensity of these reporter ions. So uh, the, when you, the TMT experiment is, uh, is often used, but it's, you have to know that it's limited to uh, eight, um, 18 samples. Uh, per TMT experiment. So if you have more than uh, 18 samples, you need to have several uh, TMT experiments and try to align it as we discussed uh, before and can be sometimes uh, can sometimes be difficult. Um, another way to um, to use um, isotopes is when you make targeted experiments. So in that case, we are interested in specific uh, proteins in your sample. So you can add uh, peptides that are uh, synthetic peptides that contain these isotopes. So you order the same uh, sequence that the peptide you are interested in and you, uh, you add it in your sample. So this is an example of uh, uh, selective regression monitoring, so targeted proteomics. So you see that the mass spectrometer first selects 
uh, uh, precursor ion, so a peptide, and then fragmentate it, and then select a fragment. And this gives us the specificity. So we know that we are, because we are selecting this uh, parent fragment uh, transition, we know that we have the good peptide, and we can do that for the label uh, um, synthetic peptide and for the endogenous, endogenous peptide. So we target both masses. And what we get in the end is something like this, that, like that, you see two peaks. So you see it's the same sequence, but there is two uh, different masses. So one is 602 and the other one is 606. So the EV peptide is the blue one. And then you see your endogenous peptide and usually you measure the, the ratio between the EV and the light to uh, get the quantification. You have questions? Okay, so now the label free. So label free is when the samples are prepared and analyzed separately. And uh, we are measuring the quantification uh, by uh, integrating the area under the chromatographic peaks. So to do that, you have to remember that LCMS is a dynamic process. So here you have an example of peptides that are on your liquid chromatographic column. So you have three peptides and you add acetonitrile to elute your peptide uh, through the mass spectrometer, towards the spe mass spectrometer. So you see that uh, so P1, uh, peptide P1 is eluting. So it starts to arrive at the mass spectrometer and you get a signal uh, on the, um, on the, on the on the first spectrum, so you can uh, you can um, plot this uh, the intensity of this signal on a, on a graph uh, um, between retention time and intensity. So a uh, few milliseconds after, you get a second spectrum where this intensity is increasing because there is more and more peptide eluting for the chromatographic column. So you get a second dot, and so on. So you continue the peptide is eluting, and when there is when the, the illusion is finished, the signal uh, decreases until it disappears completely. So this draw uh, chrom what we call the chromatographic peak. So in proteomics, we call that extracted ion chromatogram. So we can really extract this information. So we don't do that manually. So of course, it's software that are doing that because you have to do that on uh, thousands of, uh, of uh, peptides. And uh, we use the area under this uh, our software, use the area under this curve to get the quantification of the peptide. Yeah, we can compare uh, the, the, area, the area of the same peptide. So you know that it's the same peptide because you have the same mass. So it's 601 and you have the same retention time. So the software, software say, okay, it's the same mass, same retention time. So I can integrate these two uh, peaks and give a, a ratio of this, uh, of this two, between these two ones. So in, um, so in DDA experiments, uh, this integration is usually done on the, the MS1 uh, spectra. Um, one of the software which, which is used for that is MassQuant. So uh, Jennifer is going to teach uh, on that this afternoon. And for the IA, we usually use um, MS2 uh, spectra for the, to, for the integration. And we try, we try to have um, an overlapping of the, the different fragments um, that, I, the, that I use for quantification. So I will uh, uh, discuss about that tomorrow morning. So label free quantification. So samples, uh, so as I said, are processed and analyzed separately. The software aligns chromatogram, extract and compare the peaks. There is no limit in the, num in the number of samples you can use, but there is a possible introduction of bias during the analysis. So uh, it's important to remember that is, we need to uh, normalize the data, use replicates to have um, an, uh, good analysis and good data processing in the end. Okay, so this is just to show you what we are going to cover in this uh, workshop. So we choose to um, to discuss about uh, bottom-up proteomics and wall proteome analysis and spe specifically uh, label-free quantification. So in three days, we don't have time to cover all the <laughs> proteomics, but this, um, this uh, workflow is what is mostly used in, uh, in proteomics now, so that's why we, uh, we decided to, uh, to cover that.
Um, what time is it? So we have 10 minutes. So I have more slides on specific application and can go quickly through that. So maybe I take question before if you have some. Yeah. Just I have a question. If we do the whole protocol and analyze it, is it possible later to be changed, you know, the results uh, to the target proteins? Because for example, for First, I would like you know to know the whole protein mix you know changes in my samples, but later you know based on what I see in the whole protein mix, maybe I would like to be more targeted in few proteins. Is it possible you could just shift the results, or we have to also go back, prepare new samples, and just change the you know setting for the instrument to have the target? Yeah, it's often like this that people are doing discovery experiments in with the whole protein analysis and then wants to make a targeted analysis on potential candidates. So uh, in that case, you need to reprocess the sample for the, the LCMS experiment because it's a different uh, um, acquisition mode. Uh, so you can do that on the same samples if you have stored your uh, peptide uh, digest in a protein digest uh, at minus 80, you can use it to, uh, for a targeted experiment. Uh, most of the time, it's a validation of the first experiment. That, so it's often that people send new samples to confirm what we have seen in a discovery experiment. But yeah, it's possible to uh, to 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 make it from the same samples, but you need to rerun the um, the analysis, not the, not the sample prep. The sample prep is the same. Mm -hmm. I just wonder how in your line do people operating the machine and people doing the analysis? You know? So it's very dependent on, on the on the platforms. So, so here in Quebec, we are able to do all the process. So we sometimes people they just get uh, send raw samples. So we extract the proteins, uh, make the digestion, run the LCM an analysis, make the data processing, statistics, and everything. But this, yeah, it's the same people from our side. Yeah, it's the same people. But it's, we, are, we have a technician and we have also uh, people more in uh, mass spectrometry, but they are also trained for uh, data processing. But uh, yeah, we have uh, customers that have prepared the samples themselves or others that want, that want to send the, uh, the results to the statistician because they need complex uh, analysis. So it happens sometimes that uh, we do just a part of the job. But it's really depending of platform. There is platform that just send you the the results from the mass spectrometer, and you need to uh, to deal with that by yourself. So it's really uh, depending of the, of each uh, each platform. So for this specific application, um, I think I'm going just fast for the two first uh, uh, application because uh, Jennifer has talked about that uh, this morning. So I realized that we have a bit of overlap on that. So. Uh, maybe I can uh, go um, to the third one. So, so the interactomics is when you analyze um, uh, immunoprecipitations and uh, PTM analysis. Uh, so as, uh, as she said, it's, it's very interesting in proteomics to have this access to, uh, to, to PTM um, identification because uh, yeah, sometimes people are uh, interested in, uh, uh, in gene expression, uh, they, they make uh, arena sick. So, or proteomics. So the difference between uh, transcriptomics and proteomics is uh, it's sometimes important. You can have um, uh, the, sometimes the, the co correlation between the two is not so high, so it's good to make proteomics. But in addition, proteomics, it's important because you can access that, but you, of course, cannot access uh, with RNA-seq. Um, I okay. just, just to mention that there is a software tool that is de dedicated to PTM uh, search. So it's a, it's, co it's a commercial software, but it can be sometimes interesting uh, when you are uh, very interested in PTMs. Um, okay. So there is other specific application that can be done in proteomics that are interesting to know, even if, so, if it's not something that we are doing very uh, frequently. But uh, for example, HDXMS. Uh, so it's the, it stands for hydrogen deuterium exchange mass spectrometry. So we don't do that on the platform, that, but there are labs that are very um, uh, specialized for this type of experiment. So in that case, uh, you can incubate um, um, proteins uh, with um, uh, either with, uh, with um, 
with a normal uh, uh, buffer or with a buffer containing deuterium. So when the buffer uh, contain, oops, sorry, sorry. When the buffer contains uh, the deuterium, the, 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 there will be an exchange between hydrogen uh, and deuterium uh, on the proteins. So this happen on, on this is done for native proteins. So at the, at the protein level, you have this exchange, and then you can make the digestion. And when you add, uh, if you want to uh, measure if there is an uh, interaction between a pro two proteins or between a protein and the ligands, uh, you can process the same thing. So the the, the sample is uh, uh, is with the, the deuterium, and um, because of the interaction, the exchange between the um, the deuterium and the hydrogen cannot be done because the uh, the, the sequence is hidden by um, by the ligand. So then you, after the digestion, you will compare uh, the signal that you get, and you see here that we um, we have this um, this uh, red dots, meaning that we have been we have get an exchange, and on the other one, the same peptides are, uh, doesn't have the exchange, uh, meaning that uh, the this sequence was the one interacting with our ligand. So it has been as um, uh, sorry. Okay. Um, so the deuterium can power all this surface of the protein in the tunnels. So if they were within distance of the tunnel, would be like it can be distinguished from the so we can cover everything that is outside of the protein. So I guess if there is a tunnel and, and the, the liquid can penetrate inside, yes, it's, it will. It's really, uh, if it's really inside the protein, it, it down. So it, the idea is really to, uh, to see how the, the conformation of the protein and what is outside and what is inside. So it has been applied successfully to, uh, to identify the different um, um, uh, subunit of proteasome. So in this uh, in this paper, they have uh, been able to show so the, the proteasome uh, uh, 28 is the core catalytic of the proteasome, but it also interacts with regulators, different regulators, and they were able to show that the, the, the different interaction that the proteasome can have. It exists two types of uh, proteasome, the, the regular proteasome and immunoproteasome, which is uh, uh, used in uh, immune response. And they could show by this technique that uh, the difference in a uh, conformation of the proteasome when the proteasome switched to uh, the immunoform. Another um, specific application is uh, what is called thermal proton profiling. So in that case, it's also to measure the interaction between a ligand and protein. So here the idea is that um, uh, when a protein, um, when, you, when you eat uh, protein samples, uh, at different um, temperature, uh, you will um, uh, precipitate the protein. So some protein will precipitate very quickly with the low temperature, and the more you uh, you increase the temperature, and the more proteins will uh, precipitate. But when you add uh, ligand uh, in your in your sample, uh, this uh, this precipitation uh, can be different for the protein that have an interaction with the ligand. So. Here yeah, you're trying to find protein that are interacting with the ligand. So basically, you are um, <clears throat> uh, preparing samples at uh, different uh, temperatures, so control and um, and uh, control and, uh, and uh, sample plus, li plus ligand. And you are uh, preparing at different temperature and label each um, each uh, sample with uh, uh, a different uh, mass tag, uh, TMT mass tag. Finally, you are able to draw this, um, this uh, um, interaction curves. And when you see this uh, shift, it means that the, the proteins has an interaction in the, in the sample where, with the ligand in the sample where you have added the, the ligand. So in this paper, they were able to, uh, to make the, oops, sorry, it's in French, I tried to change uh, everything for English, but uh, yeah. So you have the, uh, term, the thermic profile of more than uh, 7,000. Uh, proteins in, in response to um, some um, anti-cancer drugs. So proteomics is also more and more used for uh, clinical proteomics. So clinical proteomics uh, requires that to have a high throughput um, uh, analysis because you usually have uh, uh, hundreds or even thousands of uh, samples to measure. 
uh, it also needs um, robustness of the method and high reproducibility to be able to uh, discover biomarkers, for instance, or to make diagnosis. So now it's become possible with uh, new instrumentation like this one that you will uh, see upstairs. So this uh, this uh, LC system has been really uh, designed for uh, clinical proteomics. It's highly reproducible and it's able to uh, inject between 30 and 300 samples per day. So as uh, we said earlier, increasing the number the, the number of samples, uh, the number of replicates increase the chance to uh, to have a biomarker discovery. So this is an example of um, clin of um, uh, pro um, clinical proteomics uh, experiment. So here they try to find uh, um, biomarkers for um, uh, alcohol-related liver disease, and they have analyzed um, samples for almost 600 patients so in only three weeks. And they combine this uh, um, this uh, work with uh, from this proteomic uh, data with uh, machine learning models, and this uh, make them uh, made them able to uh, distinguish three disease states uh, with more than uh, eighty percent accuracy, and define a risk score. So the discovery of biomarker in proteomics. Um, so uh, we are doing more and more of these experiments. So often people want to discover biomarkers to have a translation to ELISA, to have a method that are applicable in clinics. But you have to keep in mind that proteomics is uh, becoming probably the, the essay of tomorrow for a clinical uh, analysis. And then more and more we are going to use LCMS as diagnosis purpose. And the last things I wanted to talk because it's the odd uh, topic in proteomics is the single cell proteomics. So for a long time, it was not possible to analyze single cell in proteomics because uh, the sample from the protein amount that you can get for a single cell is very low. So obviously there is many cases where it's important to have information at the single cell level. For example, here you have an example of a brain tissue. So you have neurons, you have uh, astrocytes, microglial cells. So each of these cell types are interacting all uh, together, but they have different proteomes. And if you analyze the brain uh, uh, brain tissue all together, it's uh, like an average of all these uh, different cells. It's also the case for blood cells where we have different um, uh, type of um, uh, leukocytes like uh, B cells, T cells, and monocytes, and so on, and the uh, tumor where you have the cancer cells, but you have also these uh, immune cells infiltrating the tumor. So you want to understand what uh, what is the what what is the proteome of the cancer cell, but also what's the proteome of the um, tumor tumor microenvironment. So this becomes possible with such kind of technologies. So uh, meaning. Um, um, liquid chromatography that can handle uh, many, many samples, because of course, if you want to analyze single cells, you will get uh, hundreds, thousands of cells to measure. Uh, you need to have instruments with a very high uh, uh, sensitivity, high deep uh, proteome coverage, which is not the case with uh, one or two uh, new instruments, like the Orbit Astra. And you also need a specific uh, sample preparation because you don't want to lose uh, uh, your protein in uh, during the process of sample preparation. So you really need specific uh, methods to uh, to have everything in one pot and avoid to, uh, to lose your material. So yes, in the end, is this uh, show the the difference between um, uh, an experiment that will be done on a mix of several cells. That's what we could get from a single cell. So if you uh, measure all the population from this. Um, this tumor, for instance, you will get uh, different uh, intensities, but you will, you won't be able to distinguish the red from the blue from the, and so on. But if you uh, if you have a single cell analysis, you will see that the, uh, the profile that you proteomic profile that you get for your different cells is very different. It's also the case when uh, for uh, stimulation. Uh, so yeah, to finish, the, the single cell gives a huge amount of information. So it's uh, you get um, uh, many many uh, uh, LCMS runs with a deep uh, coverage. So it needs also new bioinformatic tool and artificial intelligence to uh, to process this data. So it's the 
it's the work of the proteomic facility, uh, proteomic uh, community now to uh, to develop this uh, this method. And my last my last slide is to show the progress uh, that proteomics has been done between uh, the the by in, in the twenty last year and what is going to be in the five or ten next year. So. Uh, you see that from uh, 2000 to now, uh, <clears throat> we have been able to increase quite a lot the number of proteins that we are able to uh, measure in uh, in one samples. But for a long time, the number of samples that we could process uh, each day was very low, and the protein amount that we need for one injection was not increasing so much. But recently, uh, we have instruments that are able for uh, to um, to make high throughput experiments, and we are also very we have also now very sensitive instruments which makes that uh, we are now able to uh, to do in single cells experiments. So that's it. <laughs> do you have questions?